All right, thanks guys. So I figured that I would talk about what we do at Mountain Sheep because game development in many ways is still something of a black card. Everybody can imagine what uh, making movies looks like. You know that there's the director, you know that there's the script writer and there's actors and then you end up with film footage that you edit and you have a, eventually have a movie. But it's much harder to understand and imagine what process of game development is. But I'm, I'm approaching this from the point of view that uh, I hope to inspire and encourage others to do some of the same kind of exploration we do. So Mountain Sheep uh, was started in 2006 with these two brothers, these strange hill brothers, because they are from Outokumpu, uh, Kimmo and Timo Vihola. And we always had the goal of making the best small games we can. So with a very small team, trying to make the best possible job. And uh, we value craftsmanship, just the ability of knowing how to put a good game together as sort of the highest value of the company. And we've been, we've been fairly successful. So over the years, over the past uh, six years, five years that we've worked on the App Store, uh, we managed to make half a dozen number ones on the uh, US charts. And we are also, as far as I know, we are the only game company to have licensed the Trollolo song from uh, Edward O'Kill. We used it for promoting Bike Baron. And personally, I've been programming for 30 years. So I decided when I was 10 years old, using my Commodore 64, that I will be a game developer. Um, I didn't know that that would end up being an actual profession. It was just that I knew this is what I want to do. And uh, oh, there we go. So in 94, just after a military service, I co-founded Hybrid Graphics, which was to be a company that would have also done 3D graphics, games, and uh, technology. But eventually, it ended up being a very much a technology company that then was later acquired by NVIDIA. So I was engine programmer for a long time. But all the while, I wanted to do games. And so after my exit from hybrid, I managed to co-found Mountain Sheep, among other small companies. And I play a lot of games. I, I always, like, when I, when I got my Commodore 64, I kept telling my parents, I don't even need a tape drive because I'm not going to play anything. I'm just going to code on it all the time. So why would I need to you know, actually load stuff or save stuff? But of course, I got games, and I got into games. And now that I'm working in tinkering with game design, I find that very useful because I do play a lot of games. And the source is that I do play a lot of games. I was just looking at my uh, Hearthstone score today. That's about 660 matches. One, so only in the winning matches, if they take 10 minutes each, that'd be like 100 hours. But I imagine it must be several hundred by now. But also, like, gamer score is 72,000. So usually people wonder, how do I find time for any work at all? But so I want to talk about how the elements from existing titles, from new titles, how we've done that inside of Mountain Sheep, and then sort of look at you know, how, what, where the difference is in being well-inspired versus cloning versus, um, well, combining things. And sometimes it's closer to stealing. And stealing is bad. Don't steal. Uh, this one, I think if you look carefully enough, you might recognize this as a game of Monopoly. But this is the original one, the one that uh, the creator was never paid or credited for when Monopoly, as we know it, came to the market. And it, it's the unfortunate situation that oftentimes it's not the original, it's not the uh, creator or inventor of the original idea that gets the credit or the money or the success. And recently, there was uh, this whole thing about threes. Did anyone here play threes? I loved threes, but everybody played 2048. So it's uh, ironically, the 2048 wasn't even the clone, it was the clone of the clone of the clone, kind of, that people got into. And, you know, there's good and bad in that. It, at least that kind of gameplay then reached a lot of people, but the original creators of Threes were a little unhappy with this, and they ended up even publishing letters about uh, their internal exchange and process of creating the game in the first place, because they, they felt that somebody just basically took their good idea and ran with it. And so Threes looks like this, and to then 1024 looks like this, very close, because this, 
the creator even said in his uh, description for the game that why would you pay for this? Like it's such a simple game. So here's a clone of it that he made for free, and then somebody made a clone of that for the web, and then back to the iOS as an iOS application. But this actually goes back to a very simple process of attention and appetite. We, we can only want the kind of things that uh, we have a taste for. We, we need to somehow acquire an appetite for these things. And I've, I've talked about this before. Like, even if you're a vegan, you can still know that you want your uh, steak to be vegan. You don't want meat on your plate. But if you are a meat eater, then you know that you want it medium rare. And if you are offered sea urchin, what would you do? How would you like it? I've had it. It's terrible. I would not recommend it to anyone. But if you're offered something like this, then suddenly there's a, there's a time before and after Tetris that basically defines a sense of what this element is. And afterwards, you can recognize that this is the kind of game that you would like to play. This is the kind of elements that you would like the games that entertain you to be con consist of. And so there's always, there's always a lot of clones, always a lot of Me Too products, always people just trying trivially to do the same thing. And oftentimes, it's not, it doesn't work out well. And uh, sometimes, it creates new experiences that uh, might even supersede and succeed better than the first ones. But recently, there was this, uh, in the spring, the Flappy Bird phenomenon, which you know, I, I found some enjoyment in that. And I, I saw the hardcore appeal, appeal. And obviously, it was followed by the sort of endless barrage of fa Flappy Bird clones. But did anyone know or play Red Bouncing Ball Spikes? This actually charted very high. I think it reached number one in the US charts right after Flappy Bird. And it is not even a game that anyone actually made. It's the game salad template of a game, like a sample game that somebody exported and placed on the App Store. And that hit number one. So, so what happened then? Of course, the obvious thing, which is you know, tons and tons of clones of red bouncing ball spikes. So then you have green bouncing ball spikes. You have red bouncing ball spikes HD. You know, it goes on and on. Only, like, as you can see, the site that I checked is on only listed the top 1,000 hits for the Bouncing Ball Spikes games. So we, we do live in an interesting world in this sense. So how do we do it? How, how do we manage? Uh, we've managed to do these half dozen games uh, that are mostly different from each other. But they also, all of them, have a lot of old school design and elements in them which make them recognizable, playable, and understandable by people who pick them up. So our first game on the iOS Minigore um, was in 2009, and followed up by Minigore 2, which is in the picture. I don't know if you played it, but you can still find it both on the iOS and uh, on Android app stores. But Minigore actually just turned five years old. So earlier this week. So we, we've been doing this for a while. And Minigore uh, came actually from Robotron. It was, we were inspired by Robotron and Asteroids, and obviously the later iterations of Asteroid-type gameplay, such as uh, Super Stardust, of which we were huge fans of. But also, even like in Finland, there were many uh, survival shooters that had been created, like the uh, Crimson Land series. And it really was about surviving against an endless wave of enemies. And the first versions of Minigore were just spheres on the screen shooting at other spheres. And we found that this was actually the minimum gameplay that we could have fun with. And we also saw that there was, there was not really a good dual stick shooter on the iOS market at the time. And we saw that, you know, we, we'll give it a shot. We sold about 150,000 units in the first couple of weeks and eventually went on to sell more than a million units. So we've been very happy with how Minigore was like, taken. But obviously, since we are not really business-minded, rather than making a sequel to our first success, we ended up taking another four years to do completely different things, which the next one was uh, Bike Baron. 
Spike Baron was, it was actually, some people criticized it to be a trials clone, uh, complaining that even the controls are very similar, even like they're like in sa same kinds of places, the acceleration and the tilting. But at the end of the day, uh, trials was not on the App Store. There was no, um, no game that would have tried to create character for itself and uh, take that place of a trick bike game, which actually didn't come from Trials, but came from Action Supercross, and uh, then elements combining to this from like e even Angry Birds. We, we made a track editor for the game, and that actually ended up creating a lot of content. There's currently more than 660,000 users submitted levels for Bike Baron. And those go far beyond what we could have created internally. But for us, it was about making the kind of trick bike game that captured the old uh, action supercross type of gameplay. Ice Rage was another, uh, actually a quick project that we based on an old concept or game called Hat Trick. That was uh, in the 85, 86, it was a ballet game in the US called uh, called Hat Trick, uh, that uh, it, was, it was a kind of game that made you break your joysticks because you're turning them too hard even though they don't have analog controls. But uh, I, I remember people breaking, breaking those uh, plastic quick shots and such in the Commodore 64 era. But we took this base concept, this uh, simple one-on-one -on -one ice hockey, and uh, we even kept the original idea of making the goalie controllable at the same time, which kind of makes it a combination of Pong or you know, shuffle puck more than an actual ice hockey game. But still, we went, ended up getting it to the top of the, uh, top of the sports game charts, where we, made, we at, at least at some point, sold better than uh, EA's licensed uh, sports and you know, the big NHL ice hockey games. But of course, we also we didn't just clone it. We included elements from other games that, and in the way that we liked, like the tackling that uh, was in Speedball too. But that was actually because the picture that we used for the uh, game, the uh, two guys fighting, because it was such such an aggressive image. There was a lot of people that said that uh, they were disappointed there was no actual fighting in the game. So we actually added a fighting mode as well. So we created a rage off mode where you can actually win by beating the other player. And it worked out well. Um, Death Valley was created together with uh, Corn Fox and Brothers. They are the team that uh, did Oceanhorn for iOS and they are still cohabiting our office. So they have one room in the office and we have the other rooms. And uh, even though we're not directly collaborating, it's very fun to watch them work on Oceanhorn and uh, see what they come up with. But back in 2011, we created Death Valley as a remake and tribute to the original Death Valley by Remedy. And really, I, I have fond memories of playing the original Death Valley, but it's always interesting to go back to those titles and see how much of it is a memory, how much of it is you know, actual truth. And it was pretty rough in some corners, but it still was fun. And we like to think that we managed to capture the feel of the original. And this one, in this one, we didn't have to go very far in uh, sort of inventing new things because we were taking an old one and uh, sort of giving it a new, new birth. King Hunt uh, was our latest one on the iOS. And in this one, this actually took us a long time to create because uh, what we tried to do was take Fruit Ninja type of gameplay and uh, just make it more explosive, more colorful, add a lot of things. And uh, we actually tried to explore and add things to it that didn't, didn't stick. So what happened was that uh, we took the core mechanic inspired by Fruit Ninja and we, we used characters from, that are very recognizable from our, our other, other games and then we tried to add a lot of things to it. And we actually, we actually failed. We hit number one on the charts, but we failed because uh, the exploration of combining these elements to it 
it's very slow. It's, it takes, like, for example, we wanted to add RPG type of elements, upgrades to it. And, uh, well, to have any meaningful upgrades of your slicing weapon, uh, that would mean that the characters would have to have some sort of health or hit points. And as soon as we added hit points for them, it became unclear whether you were hitting them or not. And, you know, we had to back back from that. And that kind of killed the whole progressing thing. And, you know, we tried to add shields for them so that you'd have to first tap the shield away and then slice the enemy. And that didn't work. That was no, not fun either because, again, it was unclear whether or not you were doing the right things in this, this game. But also the market changed because we took such a long time that uh, premium games are now di much more difficult to sell on the App Store. But we did hit number one when we gave the game away for free. So at least in a world where a lot of people are paying to get downloads, we managed to give away 2.2 million copies of the game in one week. And that was, you know, it's nice. At least it entertained a lot of people. And there were a lot of people saying that it is like, you know, like Fruit Ninja, but better. There was some of the reviews. But Hardland, this is our new game. And it's quite hard to justify why a mobile developer decides to go PC. This is just a time lapse captured in, from the current, current build of the game. I will try and run a demo quickly, but my laptop is not very, it's not really designed for this game, so uh, we'll see whether it, it runs or not, but at least, you know, I, I'll give it a shot. But Ireland is a combination of a lot of things. It's a, an open, emergent world exploration game, which has a world like Minecraft with Diablo style looting and enemies and you know, rogue style generated environment, but also a game where you are building your own story as you go, go on your adventures and are basically creating a legacy as you interact with the characters. And the design process and the vision was actually our artist Timo, he likes to do these uh, 2D inspiring 2D pixel art things. And uh, he's, he's done sort of storyboards, because we don't, we don't actually write game design documents. We think that uh, we're a slightly strange game company in that, but, but we, don't, we don't write documents, and we don't have such a formal schedule or budget or even producers in the company. So we just kind of go with the flow. And so with Hardland, uh, there were these uh, 2D pixel art images, and this is sort of what explains of what, what kind of things happen in the world and how you end up interacting with creatures, doing missions for them, and eventually discovering how you live in this. So it becomes something between a you know, role-playing game, a survival game, and an you know, exploration game. And yeah, there's, if, if they even, when people ask that whether you can ride creatures or not, then yes, you'll, you'll even be riding foxes and whatnot in the game. At least that is our current vision. And it is this vision that we are now marketing to people as sort of early access game. But going back to, you know, before we go to, back to Heartland, uh, going to just, you know, games and uh, doing original games to begin with, that it's okay to share features between games. I've, I've seen a lot of people who want to, like students or early, new, new game developers who want to do their original new things, and they go a little bit too far into trying to make everything novel, because you, at the end of the day, you still have to have that taste for the things that it consists of, because appetite will only work if you have, if you have some fantasy of what this game can offer you beyond the sort of usual expected default experience. And so if it looks like completely different, completely strange, it will actually not attract any players at all. So it's a good idea to play games. And this is how I justify it for myself anyway, that you, by playing a lot of games, you can identify the elements that make the game good. And it is all about you know, how it feels to you, how you enjoy it, rather than, you know, it's got this feature or that feature. And when you do do this, then 
this is a you know an open plea. If you copy things, if you tribute to things, please let people know. They will recognize anyway. We we said openly with Ice Rage that this idea is based on this '84 ice hockey game. But even still, like when we show it to people, they go like, "Oh, I recognize this. Like I used to play a game like that. Is this like the same?" And yes, of course. Um, it's not never a very good business plan to uh, steal other people's content. But let's see, we have we have a bit of time. Yes. So before going to the Hardland demo, uh, I want to just go through a few designs of games that I've enjoyed very much, and just pointing out things that I see as elements that you know these these inspire me. These are the things that I would take into my toolbox as I'm designing or creating new games. Um, this is one thing that I realized recently, that uh, storytelling might have actually gone over this strange hill of uh, never being, at least in some way, never being as wild as it used to be in the uh, days of the 8-bit and 16-bit RPGs. Because uh, we now need such huge production values for everything that is really inconvenient to start telling a story about, you know, end of the world or you know parallel universes or time travel, whatever. Like as as soon as you go into this, uh, the current production costs either limit the environment to being very small so that you can spe can have specific content, or you end up with like time travel only changing a couple of textures in the world. But back in the day when graphics and you know technology were simpler. It was just acceptable. It was fine. You, you could make a game that said that, OK, this is the end of the world, and you just describe it in a few lines, and that would be fine. And you could escalate the story that way. There's, uh, there's a couple of abstract games that now do this. Uh, for example, um, Dark Souls has been enjoyed by a lot of people because the lore is actually in the text that describes the world as you, know, you go and play it, but rather in a sort of ambient way, and it doesn't involve a story in itself. Um, there's some of the, uh, like w one of the games I spent so much time with was uh, Alpha Centauri. Obviously, Sid Meier is now revisiting this with the new, new science fiction civilization game. But Alpha Centauri was interesting because it allowed you to define even political systems yourself and uh, combine elements to forge your units. And it was like this huge, complex sandbox of units and strategies. And I, I always enjoyed that I found that by nerve stapling all dissidents and uh, forcing a you know, unified, recycling, centrally controlled police state, you could take over the world. That was very nice. It was a very educational game that way. Uh, emergent gameplay, net hack, and the like, which just adds a lot of interacting elements and complex interaction. They, they've always been ins inspiring to me because I can, I can always understand the individual elements, and I can see how the elements combine to create something greater. And this is something that we're aim aiming for in Heartland, that even though we create simple characters with simple rules, their interaction of, with the rules and with the environment ends up creating an experience that is greater than we could have ever architected ourselves. When uh, Burnout came out, uh, that was actually quite mind-blowing for me that somebody, somebody on the team had decided it's OK to turn the camera away from the road as you just uh, tackled some player out of the road and actually go and look at the crash and then turn back. And that's crazy. Like, how, how, can, how can anybody suggest that you can just go and you know, look away from the road during your driving and racing? And, and they made it work. The, the design was such that uh, it, it slowed down time, and it uh, actually made you invulnerable for the moment that you were viewing the crash, and then still kept you invulnerable for the very short moment after the camera returns. So it never felt like you lost because you were just you know, watching this uh, crashing happen. And it was perfect. It was uh, you know, something that 
I'd love to see in a lot of games that the game would just take the time to show you the interesting things that are happening. But then there are even like games like this, uh, the uh, Backyard Monsters, which directly inspired uh, Clash of Clans. And I don't see any malice towards like people, like towards Supercell for understanding that this kind of game was missing from the market. And they, they when, when they took some of the asynchronous attacking models, which makes it actually, makes actually easier to develop. Uh, they also evolved many of the core concepts, like they didn't make you wait and get bored waiting for uh, buildings to regenerate, but rather made it a very nice flowing attacking and recovering process. And then there's Hearthstone. I, I've enjoyed Hearthstone a lot. I'm an old Magic the Gathering player, so um, I kind of hope for that kind of experience. But the confident choices that made Hearthstone work were that uh, instead of selecting blockers, attacks always go through, but you have taunting enemies that automatically choose to block instead of interrupts that would pause the game at every point. Everything, every secret that you play is ultimately triggered. And you can't discard the other player's hand or their cards, which means that uh, they can already be planning their turn all the time as they play. And it just keeps going fast and keeps dopamine levels high. So it's an easy, easy dose for me. Fallout, I'm going to skip because I want to show you the demo. But the summary, in summary, it's a good idea to explore all, all kinds of games, to see what's good about them, and develop kind of a toolbox and a feel for how you know, these things work. And when you do credit your sources, uh, let's see if I can make Hardland run. Yeah, bear with my laptop. It's uh, fairly slow. Let's run everything on the high performance. AI. Yeah, it's okay. So right, um, Hardland has been in development from January this year, and it is already in early access in that uh, it's not on stream, Steam Greenlight or anything yet, but uh, we have given it to a select number of people, and if you are very interested in participating, testing, and you know, giving us feedback, then it's quite possible to, uh, by sending us a message, that as we go along and add more accounts to it, that uh, you might be included. But uh, it's the first directly to PC game that we've done. So we have both an interesting learning curve, but also high hopes. As it's harder to do iOS games that are on the premium market anymore. Launch up just in a moment. The approach that we're taking with Hardland is that it is in early access and it will come to stream, Steam Greenlight or such and uh, be available to players so that they can interact and give us feedback on how the game can be evolved. It is loading. <laughs> well, I fear that we might actually be out of time before we get to see this on my laptop. Unless it just started. Well, for, for people at the, uh, at the event, I'm happy to show after the, uh, the seminar. If somebody's interested, I can show the game live and running.
but now I guess you'll have to do with both the uh, pictures and the video that uh, we've sh we've shown on the uh, shown in Facebook. And if you go to Facebook and find Minigore, then the Minigore group is where we have been posting videos and uh, pictures of Hardland. And so, in terms of Hardland, all the important questions. It's coming out when it's done, but it's already playable. You can send us money. It's always nice. And yes, I'm single. If there's, uh, if there's questions, you can always contact us. We're really bad about uh, answering emails. We're sorry about that. But uh, you can add me both on Skype or Battle.net, although I think that the uh, Battle.net hashtag number is wrong. It's 2402. So careful when you do that. But that's it. I, don't, I think we're out of time. But uh, thank you for your attention. And if somebody's interested in the demo afterwards, please come see me. Thanks, guys.